Hi, everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. And today I'm talking to Rachel. We've talked to her before on the channel. You may recall uh, she has a channel called LDS Women and Priesthood Power, uh, but she talks about all sorts of different things and she has a really good channel. I'm going to put it in the description below, so make sure to check her out. And uh, I just wanted to catch up with her because it's been a while and get her thoughts on, uh, you know, what she thought about this general conference. We've been talking a lot on the channel of just what seems to be the significance of this general conference and some of the incredible things that were said, uh, especially by President Nelson, Elder Bednar. Uh, I, for me, those are the ones that kind of stick out. And I feel like for a lot of you, uh, it's kind of the same. But Rachel, what were what's your thoughts on this last general conference and what stood out to you? So um, I, um, I <laughs> had a kind of a funny experience in that I got shortly after our last interview, my husband and I found out we were pregnant, which is exciting. I'm pregnant. Yay. It I kind of felt like, um, and it was pretty, I was pretty sick. Uh, and so for women who've been in that situation, you realize um, you kind of feel like Rip Van Winkle and that you go into like hibernation and you come out and like the world has changed. <laughs> so some of the cultural norms and the way our world has changed have been like even in four months of kind of really being very out of it. The way our world has changed in just four months has hit me pretty hard. And so conference, catching up on conference maybe was a little even more intense than it would have been because our world is just changing at such a rapid pace. And you can kind of take that for granted if you're not clued in all the time. So I think there were a few things. I mean, I think uh, I mentioned to you, Sister Yi's talk about healing was mm -hmm. um, absolutely phenomenal. I thought a beautiful way to kind of talk about um, dealing with kind of the realities of difficult, difficult people in our lives and to make the goal like the healing, healing and the atonement. But then I was, was talking to you about this. So we had this discussion in Sunday school a few weeks ago about the, the you know, we're about to go through this major voice and tone change in the Bible, right? You've got the end of the Old Testament that is very foreboding, kind of menacing. You've got Amos, Obadiah, and they're very, and Jonah, and they're very much, um, their, their tone is very, negative like negative is not the right word but it's meant to instigate it's meant to motivate people and to motivate people because of coming cataclysm they are describing some very awful things that will happen if people don't repent and then you shift tense for the new or you shift tense and tone for the new testament where people are very happy and hopeful and they're very focused on christ and i have meditated upon that because it seems like President Nelson is kind of in both spaces where he is like Amos and Obadiah are the way they spoke is a result of the things that happened to them. You could include Lehi in that. They received visions of truly horrific things that were going to happen to their people, like bloodshed beyond anything that we can really maybe really understand. They saw that that was going to happen. So how would you respond with calling people to repentance? What voice, tone, language would you use to try and motivate people to change? Mm -hmm. You have the New Testament, which we all love because it's so, it's so happy and it's also very gentle, like a very gentle hearkening to come to Christ. But when you look at the, um, the people writing the first four Gospels, their experiences was they got to see the living, they got to see Christ come back to life. So they were witnesses to one of the most hopeful miracles that the world's ever seen. So of course their tone would be very hopeful, very hearkening, very, and, and I was like, it's amazing to me that President Nelson, who sees what's coming, it has made, has been able to strike a tone in both places. Like he's warning us, he's calling us to repentance, but he's also remarkably positive for someone who's leading us through, honestly, some pretty evil times. So I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Well, I, I guess there's kind of like two two sides of it because uh, we're approaching the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And 
it depends on which side you're on uh how you're going to experience it and they keep talking about how for for us for for righteous latter-day saints uh the future is very hopeful it's something to look forward to um great things are going to happen one thing that really stood out is how he talked about between now and when christ comes again and he said in coming days we've talked about the fact that he didn't say in coming years or in the near future or whatever he said in coming days uh that we're that we as latter-day saints um that are living righteously are going to have privileges and blessings and miracles so i think that there's kind of two things going on uh on the one side it's like guys things are going to get really exciting and we have good stuff on the way but at the same time you know we still have stragglers and he still we still have this mission to warn the world about what's going to what's going to happen and um you know <clears throat> i keep bringing this up on the channel one of the most amazing things i ever heard him say was in 2019 when he said that time is running out because they've never really been that explicit before there's always been like warning but like that was really that kind of like put almost like a time frame to it. If time is running out in 2019, what does that say about right now? And then I don't know uh, necessarily what the significance was of uh, the way that he said goodbye this conference, where you know he tearfully said, "May God be with you till we meet again." And then we we sung that song. There was something kind of to that, like he was feeling something as though he knows something. And there's been all sorts of different ideas about what that may be. Some people thought, well, maybe it's because he knows that this is his last conference. But there's been a lot of other people that have felt, well, no, he knows what's coming. And uh, it could be that the second coming is really close. And this is it. I did all the warning that I could. And, you know, um, or, or simply that there's going to be tribulations or things I, I tend to think that the second coming is closer than we than we think but that's what i think about that yeah and um and yeah comments, go ahead. your comment for people who've been watching jared or who are new check out his comment section because the comments he will get are from so such in, like some of the comments are like someone wrote in there and i don't know how credible you think it is um that they know someone knows president nelson and he's a little more frail than he lets on. He's a little more, he's, he's getting old and mm -hmm. underestimate that because he does seem so agile and so animated. But that was interesting to me because it could also mean that we need to, and I, I mean, I remember when President Hinckley died, you know, we need to prepare ourselves to expect maybe like a leadership change too that yeah could, his time like you said like his time is coming short and he has sealed his testimony you know with his life and he's truly felt like he did the best he that that's another possibility and so it's interesting because i know a lot of people who are maybe more loyal to like certain personalities of leadership in the church than they are to the gospel and so we need to make sure that we're loyal to like the gospel Will still stay the same no matter who is the head of the church um and that always comes with it in the church changes that are always kind of like destabilizing you're like okay what's, what's gonna happen next um so that was an interesting comment though i don't know how credible you that. i guess only time will tell we've talked a little bit on the channel about how <clears throat> in the order that they were called to the apostleship you had uh president nelson first and then after that president oaks um at the time elder nelson and elder oaks and then after that uh m russell ballard and you so you have like this russell m and then m russell and in the middle you have president oaks and so we've thought about the idea and it's weird because um actually sister nelson brought that up in the the nevada devotional that fact uh not not bringing elder president oaks into the into the play but just talking about how president nelson and um president ballard's names are so similar and sometimes they get confused and i i don't know why she necessarily brought that up but it was it was interesting so i don't know maybe well, president oaks will be the next one uh, like you are really good at identifying chiasmus or parallelism like the number of times president nelson will speak 
decreasing, pausing, and then increasing per conference. So there's like a parallelism there where you kind of see like a mirror of happening. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's really, that's something to think about. It's hard because, um, you know, it's, I, I'm like the way that I tend to watch your channel. I feel like there are people who are nibblers and there are people who are bingers and I'm a binger. <laughs> I will like mm -hmm. watch, I, I, you know, an entire year of your videos and then know everything. And, you know, people will make comments in the section like, well, you know, Christ is going to come when we're righteous enough. And we're like, oh, you silly. You haven't been paying attention. You don't know that that's a rumor. We've talked about that 80,000 times in this channel. Like, <laughs> um, you know, uh, so then I'll, I'll binge and I'll get really hyper-focused and I'll, and that's all I can see, right. In our world that I can see it everywhere. And one of the things that I really do like, which surprised me about studying the priesthood, um, when I kind of took on President Nelson's challenge at, oh gosh, I should, in 2019, he literally told the women, like, do all you can to study the priesthood. And so I started studying it, thinking it was, it was this kind of masculine thing that um, was a little bit out of my lane, even though the prophet had told us to. And what I really have discovered more and more is that it has so much more to do with the temple. Like the more you study the priesthood and the way it functions and the design of it is to bring men and women together to create a pathway towards eternity, it really does turn your heart and your perspective towards the temple a lot more and turn your perspective more towards eternity a lot more. And so when you get, that's one of the things I notice about whenever I immerse myself in some of the content that you have or this discussion you have about looking for and being honest about our label, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, like we are Latter-day Saints, we believe that Christ is coming, that we will be there for it. I always ine inevitably feel this pull towards like the temple and things of eternity and like a bit of a detachment from the world a little more. Um, that, that happens a lot when you're more focused on what's coming. And I also think the more that, you know, you're focused on what that great day is, um, the less fearful you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think, I think more people need to, to focus on that. It is going to be incredible. There, there's not going to be wickedness like the way that we know it right now during the millennium. That by itself is very hopeful. Uh, I want to live during that time. Um, and, you know, just being able to actually see Christ and finally know what he actually looks like, you know, that's obviously not the most important thing about him. It's his his mission and the atonement. But I, I want to actually see what he actually looks like. I want to be able to see my 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 dead, you know, in my family and see them resurrected and in their perfect form. There, there's there's so much to look forward to. It's going to be incredible. And I feel like too many people just focus on the negative or think, talk about, oh, things are just going to keep getting worse. And yeah, that, that's true. Um, and some people are expecting like the worst, like the United States being invaded, nuclear holocaust, uh, zombies, you know, on and on and on, which I'm not going to say that that's not going to happen. It could, but I'm just, I'm not focused on that at all because it doesn't seem like that's what uh, the prophet and general authorities are focused on. They basically are just giving the warning, you know, uh, get on and stay on the covenant path. And that's where you find protection and go to the temple. And I believe them. And I've talked about how the last days, it's not just like right now, this decade. It's been going on since uh, the first vision. It's been going on since Christ uh, was crucified, technically. And a lot of horrible things have happened. We've had so many wars and we've had plagues and we've had um, natural disasters of all sorts. And I, I think sometimes people, they think it's all just for us right now in a very condensed short amount of time. But in reality, it's been going on for a while and it is getting more intense, but I, I just, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm hopeful. And, um, you know, and I don't know about you. I mean, if you have anything that you can share, don't 
feel like you have to, but I was talking to Mindy, <clears throat> which is another one of the channels that I, I've interviewed. And we were talking about how things right now are just like really different because you can see things happening on the world scale. You can see things happening on the, the church level, like all these like things that indicate that we're getting close. And then um, for me anyway, and for Mindy, uh, we feel like there's been a lot of things happening in our personal lives, just like little things like more guidance, um, just kind of like personal revelation and stuff like that. Just little miracles. Uh, I don't know if, have you had anything like that? I mean, so I, I got sick pretty, I was, I was, I had hyperemesis, which is when you're just so, so sick when you're pregnant that you can't do anything. And so I was released from as young women's president, which I had been young women's president in our ward for two years. And it was really, um, it was an interesting time because my husband and I got to kind of reflect on the blessings that had come from such a, it was a insanely demanding calling. <laughs> like it was, it was like a job. <laughs> like, um, and, but it was so interesting to see how that, um, that calling had matured and developed us and our testimonies as a couple more rapidly and more like it's like than anything we've ever had in 11 years of marriage and one of the things that I felt like had come from being involved in the youth which is a very like you are right there with the doctrine and you're right there with what the world is saying because the girls are being exposed to what the world is saying so you know what's going on you're, very, you're under no illusions as to how the world is devolving and the way they, the, the many ways the adversary is trying to get the young women to um, dismiss or not have faith in family life, in marriage, and having children, particularly. That was one thing surprised me, the number of girls that were like kind of getting on the bandwagon of, you know, I'd rather travel, get a career, have a career, I'm not really interested in children. Um, we came out of that time feeling very confident in our testimonies of the family proclamation. And that was honestly many levels like a miracle for our family to have had that. Um, that is one thing that I think comes back to what President Nelson I've had this conversation. I've had this come up in conversation with a few friends is President Nelson's injunction where he says in you know, days are coming where you can't receive personal revelation for yourself aren't going to make it essentially that's a paraphrase and that phrase i think lingers in most of our minds <laughs> it haunts a lot of us that um borrowed light borrowed oil like this time's up you're gonna have to have those hard conversations with yourself turn to the lord try and get spiritual confirmation for things because and and this is what i meant by um kind of being sick, waking up and then seeing how the world had changed. I've been surprised how many members in my own board and my community have pivoted their perspective on the family proclamation and that their faith has lessened in the family proclamation. And they would much, they would prefer that we were more like the world. And that's hard. Uh, that was just within four months. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I noticed it more aggressively. Um, it's more that I think even though I'm on the same page with you, the recent press statement about supporting legal gay marriage, that the church came out with, like, I understand it, but for people who, who are more, for people who hope that we will go the way of the world, who are mildly embarrassed of our beliefs, who are members, um, they feel emboldened to be a more critical of the family proclamation. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about the family proclamation is that when you look at like the original signers of the family proclamation, who's left in the quorum of the 12. So we've got Russell and Nelson, Oaks, Ballard, Holland, Bednar, um, less than half were the original signers of the family proclamation. Elder Bednar signed it? I don't know, actually. That's a good question. I'm not sure if he, I don't 90, know. I... 95, it came out. He was called later. So I'm getting four. Okay. Well, whatever that that's been, yeah okay. Irene, so it's interesting to see like, in many ways, like, I think that's been hard for 
not hard, but surprising. Like I always expected the world to become more worldly, but to see worldliness become part of our culture and our church, some like with certain people, with lots of people, that's been even more difficult to navigate because it means that you need to be really, really confident in your testimony to doctrine because you might be friends with members of the church who don't have a strong testimony to doctrine. And wards are remarkably, uh, like culture in a ward is remarkably subjective. So like strong personalities who have opinions about him, I've seen it happen. I've seen women who have very critical takes on the family proclamation and um, really influence other women to have doubts about it and think it's a backwards document and we should be more like the world. We should be embracing these family, these non-family ideals. And that's been hard to see and something surprising. I have a state president that I knew who's kind of fallen away. I have, it's just kind of funny. It's like my friends will say like, no one's going to get through this unscathed whatever your political persuasion, whatever your family situation, like we're all going to be, we're all going to have to really remember what Russell and Nelson said, which is like, you don't have personal revelation getting through this. The confusion, the social confusion, the peer pressure, even in our own wards is really going to affect you. I don't know if that's the situation you're having in Kansas, but I definitely know people in Utah are dealing with that. I'm in North Carolina. So. Um, actually, yeah, not so much here, uh, as you might expect. Um, when I was in Arizona, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was in a couple wards that were more, uh, kind of affluent. Uh, we were, li- we were living in nice areas and, um, yeah, there are more struggles in, in terms of those kind of things and wanting to, um, I guess, appease the world, appease their, their worldly friends or, or whatever the case may be. I'm sure each one has their own individual story, why they're doing what they're doing, but yeah, not so much here in Kansas that I've seen, but I have noticed over the years, just looking at all my friends, family, people that I went to high school with, uh, people that I went on my mission with, uh, that are just, it seems like a lot of people are making a lot of choices right now, like final choices. I wish I, I wish I could say that objectively all i can say is it seems to me like that's been the case um but i think in general a lot of people are are sensing that as well that people are either going this way or that way and um i feel like that's just another sign that we're getting just that much closer people are making their final selections about it like like the um it's almost like a really steep incline where like the differences between the way of the temple really like that's the that's the that's really like the standard isn't it it's the teachings of the temple the way we're supposed to live according to that like is the standard and then there's the way of the world and that might involve people who you go to church with um the differences maybe before were kind of eh, not that big of a deal but now the, the contrasts are becoming so intense um that I'd never thought about that being a sign of the last days, like the intensity and the contrast between. And what's interesting with me is, and I really love what you've talked about, what's interesting living in the South, and North Carolina is not the deep South, like Louisiana, but it's the South. Mm -hmm. And so all of my neighbors are Christian, um, non-denominational Christian. And we have conversations in the driveway where kids are all playing in the street. Um, So I have like four or five of them. And they are all Christian and we all are so aligned. Like the family proclamation, they don't even know how much they believe in it. Like they, we are all so aligned. And that's been super interesting, a positive experience for me to be in the South and see that there are a lot of good family oriented people who believe in Christ and believe in the principles of the Bible. And we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of friends. Like it's not just us against the world a lot of good christians in split in the world who are are fighting the fight and and that's one thing that i i'm always i feel like my husband's always cautioning cautioning me against when i get excited about like the signs is he's like just make sure that you don't detach from your community like make sure that you're still trying to strive to have those values that you value in your school board in your school system in your local legislator like we've been pretty 
good about that in our county and the county next to us about really advocating for our values in our school systems and making sure that things are not being taught in our and that's one of the things that I think is a weakness sometimes with focusing so much on the second coming is that we can't detach from the world that we do live in we need to keep participating and making sure that our values are still in our world because we have a lot of people moving out here to North Carolina they've just reorganized our state again because we have so many people moving here because why it is family friendly right they're they're moving from California they're moving from Utah and they're like things are just getting so strange in these places for the family I want to raise my kids somewhere wholesome so what I would say is like, we'll just make sure like the reason it's wholesome here is because we are not embarrassed to advocate for our values on a local and state level. Like you can't, if you're embarrassed about what you believe, there's a way to advocate for your values without being cruel or hateful, but you still need to advocate for those things in your school, in your, in your community. And that's something that Christians, non-Mormon Christians really, really get. They really understand like, we have to show up in our pu- in the public life for our values still. We can't just check that. And, and I also think you and I have had this discussion. You approach the second coming with different perspectives based on where you are in your family evolution. So like you and I have young children. Um, and like my oldest is going to be eight. He's gonna expect. So I, I'm in this place where I'm like, I am hopeful. I have a sign in our house that says like, like it's Hebrews it's the Hebrew scripture that talks about, you know, maybe today Jesus will come. It's very much a focus of our family. Like the kids pray for Jesus to come again. I think, I think it was Brad Wilcox who told us to pray for that. Or he did pray for that. He, he did pray for that. Yeah. But a balance between, I still need to prepare for myself to raise my children in the world and to try and advocate for those values in my community because I might still be raising kids here in my students. I just don't know. I don't yeah. I don't know if that's the case, but I have to live my life such that I still have a place to a family friendly place to raise my kids in five to ten years. So when you when you're older and you're looking for the second coming, you go all in. You've raised your kids, you've lived your life, you're good. But for those of us who are kind of on the younger side, we still have to like navigate raising our kids in this world we have to be a little more like invested in how things go in our communities too yeah well and and it's interesting that you're talking about that like with the the christians around you and them seeing you because i think that's exactly what president nelson is trying to point out um when it comes to uh president spencer w kimball's prophecy about the women of right now that the good women of the world it's like these christian neighbors of yours they they see you they good mormon women of the world this is the good women of the world that's interesting yeah wait say say that again this is the right you're right like he says the good like he does make allusions that it's the good women of the church but he also says like um like good like he makes it very clear that there are good people outside of the church yeah and no, yeah. yeah. And so he taught the prophecy was that um those women of the world that are that are kind of like getting tired of the way that the world is going, they're gonna be attracted to the church because of the good women of the church who are uh distinct from the world uh in happy ways. And um that is going to be such a, such a key in uh, gathering scattered Israel. He's talked about it a number of times. And I think that's exactly it. Like what you're saying, th- there's probably different ways to do it, but one way is to be open, involved in your community. And then that's going to impress the others that are around you. So yeah, we can't just withdraw and you, and you still have to live life. You have to keep doing whatever. Cause we just have to keep going until it actually comes. But um, I think that, that's kind of good that you have a lot of opportunities there uh, with your neighbors and in your community. And I talk to my wife a lot because like, we're the only active family in our town. There's a couple like other people, but they're like, they're inactive, but I, I feel such like a weight of responsibility because for a lot of these people here in town, like we may be the only chance that somebody has to come across uh, the church or someone that's a member of the church. And so we're constantly just like making sure that we're, 
being a good example, reaching out, trying to make friends and nothing's come of it yet, but hopefully it will. And um, I don't know, just now's a very important time to really stand up and stand out and um, be a light because the, because the world is getting so dark, you know, and then on top of, you know, that like attracting the, the good women of the world and all that stuff. Um, another thing is, you know, us becoming a Zion people. And a lot of that has to do with avoiding contention and um, putting down contention. And you were, you were talking about how like, sister Yee's talk like really stood out to you right because it, it has to i don't remember it very well but uh, it had a lot to do with that right yeah yes yeah. so um sister Yi, it you know it really was remarkable to have her up there because she shared that she had been in a physically abusive home for most of her life and i think that that there are so many wonderful women call um into general positions wonderful women and some of them you know have come from really wonderful lives to the point where if you've had like a flawed life you can't maybe relate as much and so for her to be so generous to share like she said my you know growing up i was really unsafe in home at home i was afraid of my dad and she really does allude to the fact that he's physically abusive to her and she talks about this journey of healing through the atonement and um, real healing. And the title of the talk is Ashes for Beauty. And for me, that talk was such an answer to a prayer because it harkened back to President Nelson's call, right? So he calls, I mean, there's several that come out to me that speak to me that President Nelson has these direct calls to us, like repent every day, and then it was two or three conferences ago where he said, um, find a conflict in your life and try and find resolution for it um, or, or resolve it. I think was, I think that's the verb he uses the word resolve. Yeah. Um, and that is that, I remember thinking about that because for those of us who've maybe gone through certain levels of abuse, that's a hard thing to do. Um, and she talks about but she talks about how resolution can be um, between you and the Lord as well. And she, she lays out this like beautiful, this beautiful pathway towards true healing and true growth. And she talks about how it took years, but she got to a point where she really did feel healed through the atonement. Um, and I haven't experienced that, that level of abuse and so but I have seen people who have gone to therapy and come out they've come out in a way that is very angry and very stuck in the abuse the why did this happen to me this is really unfair and she talks about that and she kind of addresses the idea that you can get to healing and true growth through the savior, through the atonement. And so I felt like President Nelson gave us this call and I think it, it lines up exactly what you were saying, like time is running out. Like the time to resolve conflicts with people you love is running out. And for a lot of us, he gave us that call and we're like, I don't know how to do that. How do I do that if someone has really harmed me? And she makes it very clear in her talk, like forgiving someone doesn't mean that you put yourself right back in a position to be hurt again at all. And so she makes it much more of a process that you can reconcile with the Savior, seeking true healing and forgiveness for yourself, for that other person. So I felt like there was the parallelism there with President Nelson giving us all that challenge and then Sister D giving us a specific example of how one might go about doing that in their personal life, even with the most difficult of, of situations in her, her case of abuse. Yeah, because uh the goal especially right now it's i mean it's always the goal throughout all ages of time to um forgive but especially right now as we're approaching the second coming and uh i feel like president nelson and our leaders are trying to create a zion people uh that that's well that's the definition of a zion people of one heart and one mind and pure of heart and um 
it's kind of hard to do when you're having fights or contention with whoever, family members, friends. And um, yes, it's important that she brought that up because there's some people where you will not necessarily resolve things because the other person refuses to do whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but you can step away, uh, not keep putting yourself in that situation. If they're not going to change, step away, forgive them, uh, know that because of Christ, there, there will be a final justice, but like, you shouldn't like be looking for revenge, but just know that things are going to be, uh, fixed and that person will eventually come to understand what, what they had done to you. Uh, but in, in a perfect way the, the, you know, they're going to know the consequences of their actions and they're going to have a just judgment. Um, so I feel like you can have some peace in that, just knowing that there's not justice at all. Like, you know, someone can be out there just doing whatever they want and nothing ever happens. Something will happen at the right time and in the appropriate way. And because we're not perfect, we, we're not the ones that can meet out that judgment or punishment, you know, and that's really what it's all about. Like, it's like there's a ledger and somebody stole money from you and it's like, Hey, I need resolution. I need you to put that money back. Um, you know, everything needs to be back in balance. And, uh, we're not the ones that are the debt collectors. We, we, we can't do it perfectly, but Christ can, and that's, that's his job and he can heal you. And hopefully that other person will change and they'll be healed. But if they don't change, step away and just love, you know, just understand that they're a disturbed individual. <laughs> they, who knows what's going on in their life, but just pray for them, pray for your enemies. And yeah, we, we've got to master that as we go into the second coming. Like you, Jared had said before in some earlier videos, like um, you, it was like for anyone struggling with this, if they've been abused or they've dealt with like people with narcissistic personalities, like you can, I had never understood that there's a pathway towards healing and forgiveness that doesn't really involve you putting yourself right directly back in harm's way with that person. And so her talk with Sister Yi, like anyone, I know that there's a lot more abuse in the church than we talk about or people, that's, that's probably appropriate, but for people who are struggling that and they're trying to recover and heal from that, I really would suggest her talk because it's it's a beautiful season to think about the Savior in all the ways that He can heal us, and she does a much better job of talking about a pathway towards Christ-like living when you've been so harmed. Um, and I, you know, I'm not gonna lie, we had a discussion. It was the Amos discussion in Sunday school. And, you know, the teacher asked, like, how does this make you feel? This, like, you know, the, the justice, the, the, the um, you know, the consequences that are going to come and how harsh it's going to be. And one of my friends raised her hands and she's like, we just found out that one of our, one of our nieces had been, her mom just found out that she had been sexually abused for years. And we're just finding all this out. And we feel so heartbroken for her and she is going to have so much recovery she said those days of justice are something that I look forward to she's like maybe I'm off base but God is a God of justice and people who have really inflicted me as a major harm on other people we do believe in a God who brings perfect justice to the situation as well um and it is hard to watch like I have you know I have family members who have the abuse that they experience has ruined their lives. Like it's not always this, but I do think that there is, there's a lot of emphasis being put on uh, secular therapy. And, and I think there's definitely a place for that, but not when it's devoid of the atonement process and the healing power of Jesus Christ. Because, and, and so listen to her talk because it really does, lay out a very happy pathway where you can heal, recover, and become happy again and become whole again through Christ. And she, I mean, she had a pretty bad situation growing up. So it says a lot about her overcoming that. It's a very uplifting, uplifting talk. But what were one of 
your favorite talks and conference? Well, really quick before I go on from that, um, it's interesting because like when you were talking about how like they're focusing on that right now, um, it makes me think of, I don't know if you caught the video I did where somebody sent in, well, I haven't read the story yet, but I, I talked to, to a subscriber and she talked about a recent miracle that she had uh, where, you know, I'm going to read that full story probably sometime this week. Um, but she basically, she, she, she asked me if I, if I could do like a call out to people to share miracles, blessings, privileges that have happened since last conference. And one that she had was where she had this very unlikely reunion of, of family. And she felt like it was like, had something to do uh, with the second coming the family coming together again, maybe something com coming out as a result of that uh, unlikely reunion. Uh, she has some members of the family that are not members of the church and she feels like they came away feeling the spirit and maybe feeling a little bit of a change. Um, there was like family history stuff that was exchanged. And so it was like a, a special experience. And so um, with what you were, what, with what you're saying, um, I wonder if a lot of these miracles and things that are happening between now and the second coming are possibly for that purpose, maybe other purposes too, but to, you know, bury the hatchet, uh, to try and fix things. Now it's like a, a last time to fix things before things can't be fixed, you know? Uh, so I think we would all do well to think about that. Take president Nelson's advice, try and resolve a conflict if possible. Um, and then also just reconcile us, but especially if, if you're someone that's in the wrong, you know, that there's something that you could, you've done something to somebody like say, sorry, try and try and, uh, restore the relationship because yeah, time is running out. Um, in regards to favorite talks, I, I just, you know, I, I talk about it all the time on the channel, but I'm just blown away by three in particular. Um, Elder Bednar's talk, uh, where he was talking about the marriage feast, which is the second coming. Um, and then immediately after that, President Nelson's main talk of conference, where he called on us to be the people of the second coming. And that's the one where he said that between now and when Christ comes again. And he he there was a footnote for that where he referenced the sign of the Son of Man. So between now and the time that we see the sign of the Son of Man, the Savior's gonna perform some of his no he there, we're going to see some of the mightiest manifestations of the savior's power that the world has ever seen uh and then us um we're going to have privileges and miracles and blessings between now and then and then president nelson's last talk where he shows christ coming down now it, it's to the book of mormon people but we know that that's a foreshadowing of the second coming uh, and then in that same talk, he does the tearful till we meet again and whatever. So those are kind of the three that really stood out to me, uh, probably because of this channel, but just because I've never really seen anything like this before in general conference and elder Bednar was being, I feel like he was being so specific when he was talking about the importance of wearing, uh, the, the wedding garment, you know, he kept using the word garment, uh, like hint hint you know anyone that's been to the temple you, you know um so i don't did you have any thoughts about uh elder bednar's talk i was struck by how and i really i appreciate this about bednar is, i mean he's such a master teacher and he understands like the more specific you are the more we will remember <laughs> what you said <laughs> the more we'll you know the better our recall will be um, I had done a video before I got sick, um, on the kind of the parallelism between like the, um, the 12 virgins and, um, the wedding feast that they're preparing for and how it kind of really is a parallel to a lot of the second coming. It is a, it is a parable about the second coming yeah. and it, speaks to what is our prep, what, what is something, that's the riddle that I've, I've posed at Word Council and I've asked like, what is something that you have, that only you can have that you can't share with someone else? 
And the answer is always that I get from different people is like it's life experience, something you gain from life experience and testimony. The intangible is the only you can really possess, right? So like, like learning to play the piano or learning how to drive or um, another really critical skill, like you have to go through a process of falling on your face to obtain that skill. And even if you wanted to share it with a child or a loved, loved, like a beloved friend, you wouldn't be able to, you know, you wouldn't. And that, in that video, I thought about how, you know, the story ends with the bridegroom kind of recognizing the people that were able to prepare and able to arrive at his feast. And the story ends there. And it's interesting how Bednar's story almost continues with that parable. His talk continues with that parable. Like, well, what about the people who are at the feast? What is what is a holier way of being um, in this life? Um, that's what struck me is we kind of we end the parable there at the doorway of the bridegroom. But what about at the feast? What kind of people are going to be there and um, that that struck me just like the symbolism of the garment. It's definitely something to continue. <laughs> they're they're really stressing the importance of covenants. And obviously, uh, you know, we do it when we get baptized, we renew it when we take the sacrament, but <clears throat> there's a whole nother set of covenants that we make when we go to the temple. And um, an interesting thing is how we, we've noted before that um, like before the standard was like, if, if you're a, a sister in the church, uh, either you would get your endowments when you went on a mission or you just wait until you get married. But now that guidance has kind of changed. It's like, no, just, just go when you feel like it's the time. Not You don't necessarily need to wait for either a mission or getting married. And I tend to think it, it may have to do with this, the marriage feast. Not, not to say that if you don't go, you won't go to the marriage feast, but it probably helps your chances. And uh, not only that, but probably more importantly, that there's protection that comes with uh, temple covenants. Maybe, maybe it more has to do with that, with spiritual protection between now and when he comes again. But whatever the case, uh, they've made it easier to do that. There, there's this girl in my ward, actually, that uh, she's single. Uh, she's like in her early 20s and um, been doing a lot of dating, but she hasn't really met anybody that she wants to marry yet. And right now she's thinking about that, about... Uh, going and getting her endowment um, and not necessarily thinking about go, she is kind of thinking about going on a mission, but it's just interesting how maybe she wouldn't even be thinking about that right now if it wasn't for the recent guidance and how that may serve her. I guess we'll see what, what ends up happening, but um, now is the time really, if you haven't gone to the temple for yourself, uh, you should really think about doing that, I think, because when it comes to boarding the ark, like what Sister Nelson said uh, in the British Columbia, Alberta devotional, it seems like that's how you do it. You you just make sure that you're on the covenant path and that you've advanced as far as you can and what's appropriate for where you're at in life right now. Um, but I, I've just I don't think I've ever seen such intensity uh, in in the past in like talking about these topics, like what we see now in general conference. Yeah, we, um, so going back to the, the idea of the garment. So we had a really interesting, we have some several really good military friends that, um, we feel comfortable talking about our religion with, and they were asking about, um, the temple. And like, I think they probably found out stuff about the ceremony that went on. They were asking about the temple they were surprised here that this year we're learning about, like we're reading a whole Old Testament. And one of the things I was trying to explain to them was, and I always use like the Greek Orthodox tradition. So, I mean, I've been on here before. I have a, my background in Middle Eastern studies. So we studied um, Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. It's all over the Middle East. They are a religion of symbols. And they hold on to those symbols a lot more than we do uh, outside of the temple. 
Um, so one of the things I was describing to our friends, because they were like, temples were like the whole idea of symbolism, and the idea of temple worship in the Old Testament was for people to preserve their way of life, their traditions of their fathers. Because we're so arrogant that we don't realize how quickly a culture can lose their traditions. And the idea of symbolism and temple traditions is to grab you by the neck and make you pay attention to something in a way that as time evolves, you're not going to lose hold of your traditions. And so what's interesting about this is the, the, the Elder Bednar's talk. As I remember, like seven years ago, maybe, there were all these rumblings about how they're going to change the word of wisdom. They're going to change the temple garment thing. They're going to rescind it. And they came out with the opposite. That was when President Nelson read the temple interview questions. They released a press statement really specifying the word of wisdom. And it was much more clear and much more like, um, in many ways, helpful, but it was just as strict as it had been. And I think one of the messages that we can draw from this idea is that um, the world is changing, but we will not abandon our traditions. We will stay true to the traditions of our fathers. And the major metaphor of the garment is holiness. We will continue to try to be a people who are holy, even while surrounded by peer pressure and social norms that are sinful. And what's funny is like, I did a young women's lesson where it was an Old Testament where we asked the girls to like, what is wickedness? And none of the girls could describe it because we don't really use that word anymore. It's so harsh. But when God has given you direction and you're doing something different, like, what is that? <laughs> it's, it's harsh to say it, but that's sin. Like, we want to say, there's just, I think there's just an effort to make everything relative. Mm -hmm. The reality is there's, there's God's way and he loves you no matter what, but there is God's way. Um, and then there's, there's not God's way. And I, um, when I was called a young women's president two years ago, Elder Gong came to the area, came to Raleigh, and we got to go hear him speak. And I was there with our relief study president who, if I go to a concert, I'm taking her with me. Because she got us seats in the third row <laughs> in this awesome. huge, yeah, it was like right there. And I was in the middle. Um, and Elder Gong asked his Q&A, he's like, does anyone have any questions? And I was literally six feet away from him. So I raised my hand and I asked, I asked a question. And he was very kind. And I asked him about, um, you know, how do we teach the family proclamation to youth in a way that's honest and really does say what it says without offending them, without... Um, with, not necessarily without offending them, but without making them feel um, um, like they want to turn away from it. Does that make sense? And yeah. he said, incredible answer, which I will hold on to for years. He said, uh, the Lord loves everybody. Because he loves you, he has given you a path of joy. It was just a beautiful way to put it. It was like, God loves you no matter what. And because he loves you, he wants you to have the greatest joy possible. The only way to have that joy is the path of holiness, is, the path, is a cup of that. So I, I will, I will hold on to that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, that's the right context when it comes to commandments. It's not just like arbitrary things that God wants. Like, you know what? Do it like this. No, it's all designed to bring you as much happiness and joy as possible both in this life and then obviously in the life hereafter yeah yeah because like you know there's like always the thing where uh there's like the argument where it's like well me getting married you know doing an lgbt wedding it doesn't hurt you and it's like yeah it doesn't hurt me it doesn't hurt my family it hurts you it it, it stunts your progress and it's not in you know we the way of true happiness is uh, the way that God defined marriage. And I, I realize that there's people that have struggles in this life and it can be complex, but that is the pattern. And it, and it's more than just really that um, it is about joy in a fullness of, of happiness, but 
it's also the very structure of our human family. And I'm not talking about just here on earth, but I mean like into the eternities. It's it's the divine pattern and it's the way that this is all set up and it, it gets like really deep, really um, more than what we can really talk about here. But anyway, th there's just so much to it. But yeah, it's all designed for our benefit, not just because God wants to just be a controller or whatever. Um, so anyway, well, I think that's going to be it, uh, for this one. So I appreciate you coming on again, Rachel. It's always fun to talk to you and, um, I'm glad that you're feeling better. If, if anybody has been watching her channel, uh, that, that's why she hasn't done any videos for a while. It's just because she's been sick, but uh, you're going to be doing some more videos pretty soon here, right? Uh this video I actually tried to film while I was sick <laughs> because I wanted to put the message out so much it's about it's actually my husband's favorite quote about the priesthood that I was teaching to a youth group and he said that is the best quote it's a quote by Ballard um he says that is the best quote I've ever heard on priesthood that is all you need to know like men and women and it's a really it's a it's a quote that puts things in perspective between the temple in between what we see the priest to do like at church and maybe people who are a little maybe maybe, maybe more women but like have a perspective of priest to being very patriarchal in church or whatnot like president ballard really puts all of this in perspective and gives us a more eternal view of the priesthood and honoring the priesthood in our home kids and children in our home. so that's the next video i'm going to put out um and hopefully i'll get more <laughs> awesome so you guys <clears throat> if you're not subscribed to her yet then make sure to do that again i'll put the link in the description below but you can also just go to the home page of my channel and i have the featured channels and she'll be right there i'll move her back up to the the number one spot so that she's e easy to find and uh, just make sure to do that i'm sure that we'll talk again sometime in the future um and then if you're new to my channel, make sure to subscribe, uh, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share this with anyone that might enjoy this conversation and I'll talk to you guys later.